Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Dallas Museum of Art's virtual art talk um, featuring the artist Milchen, whose mural entitled Better is now on display outside of the museum. I am Stephanie Drinka. I am the communications director for Dallas Truth Racial Healing and Transformation, a local nonprofit whose mission is to create a radically inclusive city by addressing race and racism through um, narrative change, relationship building, and equitable policies and practices. Um, so I'm so excited to be here, not only representing Dallas TRHT, but also as an Asian American woman myself. I was adopted from Korea at three months old. And so um, this piece of work has been really important, not only in my um, in the racial equity space that I work in, but also um, my personal background. So um, for Mel, I would just love to hear a little bit, um, an intro of you and um, and how you uh, developed your, your practice as an artist. Wow. Uh, well, I'm born in Houston, Texas, in the Fifth Ward area. It's traditionally, we're, we're raised, I was born in a hospital, but uh, our parents are uh, from China and we settled, they settled somehow in, in Houston, Texas, in the Fifth Ward. And it was it's become a traditional, it's a long term black Hispanic neighborhood. And it continues, continues to this day. Uh, as far as becoming my practice of uh, being an artist, I always say I'm always in a state of becoming one. So I look forward to being an artist one day. But in the meantime, I'll produce these things. And it's, in other words, uh, as a conceptual artist, I work at a with a mutative intention to be more reactive and to be... Uh, sometimes not inspired, but compelled by things around me to create objects, films, banners, uh, sort of a Malcolm Triple X by any means, action, concept necessary to convey, to convey ideas. I think that is a purpose. Thank you so much. And, and the idea behind Better, could you talk a little bit about how that came about and um, the research that went into it? Sure, sure. Uh, so better, uh, well, first of all, the Black Lives Matter movement is a profound moment in American history, I felt. The moment it happened, especially after George, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, all these things that were going down, it speaks to a real kind of pointing out the America that we live in, you know, that we've lived in, a, even the election of a uh, former president. Um, was an indication of not necessarily him or her or whoever. It was more about saying, this is what the America we live in, all the things that have come out of that. So when the movement came out, it was like, it was uh, uh, one of those obligations to say, let's respect this and see where we fit in this. And we must fit in it because of the, the societal injustices that have continued as carefully pointed out by the New York Times, since 1619, right? The introduction of just the horror of what it represents to the Americas. So anyway, that, that is the beginning of it. So uh, just wanting to support it in, um, in one way, I, I, I said, well, you know, why isn't there a Chinese language based version of Black Lives Matter? I just want to do a t-shirt and give away the design and let it go, you know? And I said, so let's take a look. But as I started to formulate, uh, and being born in Texas, the education was more focused on Texas history and the Alamo than on American history or even Chinese language or anything like that. So I'm not really, I'm not, I can speak my Toysan dialect, but I, you know, as a, as a, as a scholar of writing in Chinese, I'm deficient. So I said, because of that, I need to find someone to help me translate this correctly. What I started to find out is Black Lives Matter matters, the way it's being currently used, can be manipulated into a more pejorative sense of saying the way the characters are, 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 are constructed. And when you do this direct or this form of translation, it can mean like Black Lives are just simply precious, you know? And it's been derided by some and, and by the Chinese 
readers of this is that, oh, they're precious and we're not, you know, so it becomes an all lives matter kind of situation. And yet that was the one that was available to the public through the press when you see it written in Chinese newspapers. And that was untenable. I said, we can't, I, I, you know, ain't, ain't nobody got time for that. That's not right. You know, so to make that commitment, being, um, being, needing that kind of scholarship, I reached out to Dr. Hans Sauce. He's, he's at Com Lit in uh, Foreign Languages. He's the, one of the 17 university professors at the University of Chicago. I mean, there's in this whole existence. He's an extreme scholar of Chinese language and, and, of course, different languages from German to, you know, he's a, he's a polyglot. So I reached out to Han. I said, Han, could you look into this? And he came out with some, and as we looked into it, they were inadequate. And so we became challenged. Here I'm demanding something, right? And Han started really dig digging into his whole network of translators, because translation is a key component of his investigations. And he found uh, a translator, translator in Hong Kong and in Singapore who said, you know, that that is a problem. There's a problem with this. And they started researching these alternatives, you know, these possibilities. And they presented it to me. And I found one that was the right one it, because it was, it was more literary, uh, but it, it comes from a, a Chinese... Uh, idiom, you know, idioms that are within the culture for a long time, that in this idiomatic expression basically means it's a matter of life or death. And then by carefully putting in black lives or black souls into it, so it becomes like black souls are a matter of life and death. Now, you won't get the exact uh, reading. I think it's uh, in my text, and, uh, I sent over to the museum, it kind of explicates this kind of research. But it was driven by this need to, let's get this right, you see. So so first it started with a t-shirt, <laughs> and then I produced that confidently after many tries and many different designs. I even uh, shared my investigations on Instagram so other Asian speakers could say, hey man, that's not right. What the hell are you doing? You know, get this straight until I finally settled on one that um, different readers of Chinese, you know, language could appreciate. And I said, this is the one we're going to do. Uh, so I exposed my inadequacy was the first way to get there. So uh, then later, I'm sorry if I'm going on and on, Stephanie, we should have a combo. Uh, then later I was approached by Four Freedoms, the incredible group. Uh, that say said, could you do something for Asian American Pacific Islander Week, or, you know, month or whatever? I think it, I don't understand these things are like Black History Month, Asian. It seems like things shouldn't have a month long deadline, you know. It seems like, what's wrong with this anyway? Uh, so they they approached me. I said, yes, I would like to do something. So I wanted to enlarge on that. I wanted to not just to have the Chinese languages, you know, just without any translation, because if you wore that T-shirt, people, the point was someone would ask you, what does that say? Because, you know, how they have the, the bad tattoos that you think it says super pride and super bad. Instead, it says, you know, fried chicken wing. You don't, you don't need that, right? So nobody, nobody needs that. So I, I said, you know, I have something for you. I would like to translate, get a, a direct translation, but I'd like to add a message that it's better together. And it was a reflection on how things were going with uh, some of the reports coming out about attacks on Asian Americans uh, from people from African Americans were attacking. And was using this as a justification, look out, these, these, these polarized people. I said, we're in a polarized country. Basically, I'm gonna say it, polarized by white supremacy. And this is what the deal is. You know, when you see that, I said, it's even more than ever that we should be better to better together. We have to unify. And any prejudices or any kind of misconception or many assumptions inside, you just got to understand each other first, that their solidarity would be best. See, so better together was important to add on to this for four freedoms. So a messaging was important. And, and it started there. And the curator, your curator, you know, I call her my curator, I'm her artist, Vivian Lee, 
caught wind of it at, um, uh, at maybe the Freeze Art Fair, because uh, Four Freedoms asked me to, do you mind if we blow it up, uh, you know, 600 times for this big, big poster, you know, this big, big sign. Of course, Texas being Texas wanted to blow it up to 120 feet, you know, so you know, did it twice, it made it even better still, you know, because you, you asked for the Hispanic translation. So these are the kind of evolutions that occur, okay? And that's how it came to, to your to Dallas Museum of Art. I think what's so powerful about it also, it's not just including, you know, Chinese language and English, but also Spanish and this idea that um, all people of color, our liberation and our oppression is so intri in, 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 intricately bound together. Um, and I, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about sort of your your family's history. I saw that you were a descendant of a paper immigrant. And yeah, yeah. But, you know, I, I was doing research for Dallas and for THT. And one thing that I was surprised to learn was that the borders between Mexico and the United States and Texas in, in particular they weren't patrolled until um, America was afraid of Chinese immigrants um, escaping to from Mexico into the U.S. And um, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about just expanding between the sort of Black Asian um, conflict or solidarity and, and how everybody's freedom is so closely bound together. You know, I'll speak it. I remember when I was young, when we were bad. Uh, my mother would sometimes say, we're going to call the green clothes on you. They didn't say, we're going to call the police, or we're not going to call human health and human services. There wasn't that in, in the 50s. It was the green clothes. That's the immigrants, uh, Im you know, immigrant services or whatever, it, you know, control to take you away. You know, that was the huge threat. And so even that was in the consciousness of my parents, knowing about that. Of course, my, my, uh, my father came over with a paper name, which you're talking about, basically illegal alien with a paper name bought because to bypass the Chinese Exclusion Act that was instituted, what was it, the 1880s or whatever? And when he came to America in 39, it was still in place. It was a congressional act forbidding this immigration of Chinese, right, into America. The one singular race, by the way, no other race was mentioned. And so... Uh, and he joined the American army and was with the Flying Tigers as a, in, the, in the motor pool on Burma Road. He became an American soldier to, to become a GI, to become a citizen that way, and also be able to marry. He was looking for his girlfriend, I think. He never found her because of the war. It scattered him. Found my mother instead. I think a great choice where I wouldn't be here. And, uh, and, and was able to come back, you know. And it's, it's interesting for the, for the war. I think it was declared or repealed in uh, 1943 after the war. I mean, really? I mean, so, uh, and I always saw the slow influx of, of my uncles and cousins that eventually would immigrate over because of the quotas and all these things. And, and it was remarkable and very powerful to think that uh, my father had not seen his sister in 40 years, you know, physically because of, these things that extend in time. Of course, growing up in, a, in an African-American neighborhood, my father had um, uh, named the store Wholesome Food Market. In Chinese, that means good heart. And I remember how close he was to the community because he felt the relationship was important. He really, truly believed that solidarity with African-Americans in the neighborhood because they were his customers. And I remember so many events where um, we would give food and credit. It became this thing where a lot of Asian grocers give food and credit. But my father would never track anyone down to say it's time to pay up. Because he felt the nutrition of the community was important for all our nutrition, you see. So conceptually based, it's not just about business. It's about how you treat another person. Understanding the divisions that can occur even in America <laughs> with the prejudices against, you know, Asians always in, in there. I mean, I, I can remember from childhood hearing um, my father being insulted by a customer, a white customer, calling the children around him and saying, here's a penny, everybody. Look at this man. This is my father who owns the store. Where he comes from, you can buy him for that. 
and it's another word, teaching disrespect. And I remember my father saying something like, if I had more command of the English language, I would tell him what I thought. The pain and the anger was there. It's interesting to know that when that man eventually got sick and the neighborhood had changed in a white flight, uh, it was my father that would take him to the hospital. He was very old. And and so another thing, not to hold a grudge, but to try to progress beyond it. So the, what I learned by growing up in the brief moment in Fifth Ward was just the creativity of the people in there. Yeah, but anyway, it was, it was what you learned from a neighborhood uh, to say, you know, what I liked, especially after uh, I remember the rise of Muhammad Ali and this heroic kind of uh, juxtaposition of resistance. And I remember how that was appreciated. I mean, it was it was that. And of course, you have told so you by the 70s, you have this these two incredible icons, right? One Asian, one black. You have Bruce Lee. I always like to joke that my mother was a Lee, so I'm a cousin. But then uh, I'm a Chin, so Jackie Chan is my other cousin, you know, just to get free food. Or, it never worked, by the way. Because, <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, it is like you learn that solidarity is the better way to go. And to understand the struggle uh, of civil rights in our country is one of the other profound moments, you know, or you don't have rights. So if you want to believe in the experiment, the American experiment, if you want to believe in its promise, or not even believe, hold to it to make it real, as I say, you know, because sometimes it's like just this big experiment that is not really fulfilled with a lot of great words of, that can be confusing. One that says we the people, and the other one that says you you have the right as the rugged individual. You have one, two documents in conflict. I've made note in this in other pieces too, that you have these monuments to our thought and what we think we should believe. I believe you have to actively engage in it. I believe what Derrida says, you must consider uh, this idea of justice as something that can never be attained. Because if you think it's attained, you, 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 it will elude you. You have to work on it every day. So this idea of, um, of a, a society that represents what it says it's supposed to be about, to hold it to it and to work toward it, it's, it's in, in that you need this kind of engagement. So anyway, it's a long passage. I don't know what the hell I was talking about, but, you know. And, um, you know, just the idea of solidarity, and I think that's really the what has been so critical about your piece and how it reflects that that solidarity has been there historically between our communities. We've seen it in the Third World Liberation Front strikes, um, you know, all of the sort of coalitions that we've built over time. But unfortunately, that's not what the media shows. We see a lot of, um, of the anti-Asian violence being shown in media as being perpetrated by black Americans when actually the majority of them are white perpetrators, but it doesn't feed into the narrative of this interpersonal conflict between our, our communities. Um, so being in Texas, we're, we're now faced with a challenge of students not being taught um, the history of racism sort of in a really accurate light. And I think things like informal education and art are going to become even more critical than they have ever been. Um, can you speak a little bit more about your role as a social practice artist and, and bringing these issues into your work and how important that is to spark dialogue? Well, I, I think um, um, I have many roles because I also do other objects and political commentaries in, in my work. But the social practice sometimes uh, includes like the Funder Project, which was started in New Orleans. I went to New Orleans with uh, Rick Lowe of Project Row Houses, and Tom Finkelberg was the commissioner of arts in New York. But back then, he was a curator. We all went down uh, to try to help after Katrina. And I was moved not so much by the physical destruction. I was moved by the interviews we conducted with people who had survived the storm, lost loved ones. I was, I was moved by the magnitude of the psychological and sociological destruction that negligence and a man-made disaster can occur, like like what was the flooding of New Orleans. I saw the injustices in that, and I saw the majority of uh, the population, how they're affected. But I was stunned about what could, I could do. Being a conceptual artist, you think, oh, man, I can think of anything. I'm really smart, but sometimes you're not. Sometimes you have to owe up that the magnitude of what transpires 
absolutely prevents you from making immediate judgments and obligates you to be more than yourself. You know, that it's not something that you take lightly. So I left and I came back at first and I did research. I researched to destroy my preconceived notions. It's like researching to understand the history of, uh, of, uh, of social injustice in America and the laws that have been acted. It's a moment where you have to unearth the, the an from the answers as 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 Baldwin would say to, to find the question right that it is so essential for your development as a person to fulfill the maximum level of what you're capable of so I found out that uh, before the storm in New Orleans uh, the the lead poisoning of children within the inner city or the unaddressed areas of New Orleans was 30 to 50 percent and it was way before the storm and there's not a single penny dedicated toward it. So here's a, a case where it's not about, this is a solidarity of the concept of we to create our project called the Fundred Dollar Bill Project, which is still going on and finishing right now in Chicago. Uh, we're finishing up in Chicago, which is basically draw your own hundred dollar bill as a child, because you're not given the right to vote and anything like that, but you are being poisoned in the communities you live in. So look at that carefully. I think in Dallas, there's the West Dallas lead um, smelting plant. I've been there as well. And uh, the idea of to, to give voice, to give value to that voice, and then collect that and then present that uh, to members of Congress in this case, so that they may consider enact laws and bills that may relieve this. So in other words, in other words the, the solidarity is, an, again, uh, reinforced because you see where the pollution is. You see where this the, in the houses and the and the paint, you know, the residual paint and the because and the relationship of poverty and nutrition. You see it mostly in, uh, in uh, communities of color, without a doubt. And you see this injustice stands. It just goes year after year. So you know that the only way is to it's a, it's got to be a we project. It cannot be. Uh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to launch something. No, it has to be a mutual education and a mutual kind of respect. And then to evolve from someone who can think of an idea to then present it as as a delivery person to deliver it to, uh, you know, senators from both sides of the aisle to take it to uh, congressional leader Pelosi, but also speak to members of the congressional caucus and whoever it needs to be to keep reinforcing that that the voices of the people should be respected. Now we we collected a half a million drawings, individual drawings of hundred dollar bills. If you look at fundred.org, I don't know if you've drawn one, but you can download a template. You could draw one. And right now we finalize its delivery for the first step, not only through the halls of Congress, but the whole collection is now in the permanent permanent collection. Of the Brooklyn Museum, so you could be in the Brooklyn Museum if you wanted to. I know you're at DMA, but you know, it's okay. It's cool. You can be in more one museum. But but here's the social practice that it means uh, the responsibility because it affects other people's lives is a little important. And you have to be solid with yourself. You have to question yourself and your place in it. That you're only one part of it. You see, and so. Making a statement like better was very important to me when I was asked, you know, and even more important when I was asked, could we get it in Spanish, you know, because more, in this is case, more is better. You see, more is better. And uh, it, it through through working, you, you realize that making artwork in the so-called social practice vein was always about getting permission first to make a, to make a relationship and to do something to deserve the trust of the community you're speaking to. You see, it's, 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 a, it's an evolutionary situation as opposed to a top-down or artist has a great vision and brings it to you, you know? So that's how I think about things. Mm -hmm. The piece is so timely, um, and I, you know, I, I agree with you that Black History Month, Asian American Pacific Heritage Month, it's 
it's not enough to be relegated to any sort of time, especially when, you know, the history has impacted us so much, but we're at a really critical point in terms of the country reckoning with its history of racism and this false hierarchy of human value that has affected us all. Um, what is sort of the call to action that you hope that people take after they, after they visit the mural and they see better and they read it and um, go back into the world? Um, you know, first of all, to, to translate it within their own mind, what that means. Like, why would it be in two languages? Why would it be from a Chinese point of view or, or a Hispanic point of view? And what is that place? I mean, no matter what color you might be, what does this mean? And how do you translate it into your life? That's what I would like. And then you, you have to, you know, when I think about climate change, I think it's almost like uh, a banner like this, I hope will create a climate of questions. What is it saying? I think it starts there. I think you have to create a, um, um, a condition of curiosity to reanimate the desire to understand things because it's unusual here, you know, Dallas is predominantly, right? Um, maybe, maybe mostly white, I don't know, but I, I don't know, especially when you think about uh, the audiences to a museum as well and to say okay why would we have something that is in, in the, the, the essentially and maybe in, in two languages that you don't speak or read and one that you're trying to grapple with while the media portrayal of it is so antagonistic what is what's going on here why would there be solidarity maybe even question i just seen reports of black people beating up individual these anecdotal situations of uh, of uh, camera, uh, closed cable camera, or, you know, surveillance photo. That's all I've seen. I, I don't understand this. You know, to maybe say, well, why would this position be there in the first place? You see, because it's not about uh, uh, extracting revenge or, or even putting one, one down. Because you start understanding that, I would hope that you understand that the constructions that will tear us apart or keep us apart are are intentional, and to have it unified. Kind of big Texas style, you know, like I say, make it 120 feet, whatever, <laughs> and, and about eight foot high, and so you can read it. <laughs> and so uh, that's what I hope that this beginning of one class, I don't think anything, one single thing can, can provoke change. I think certain things create a grounds for transformation. That's what I believe. Because, you know, I don't like the word change so much is because it's about power. And power is the thing that gets us in trouble in the first place. It's control of one over another. And the question I hate, I think that uh, messages to the public like this is to, to give options that didn't exist before. That's how I think about art. I think it's a catalytic structure as opposed to many things in the world. It's an in-between because it takes that relationship to, to, to start. So. I don't know. You always hope that it's big enough and badass enough that someone will read it and say, okay, what does it say? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you very much for that opportunity. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a showstopper for sure. Um, I, what you were talking about, this sort of imagination, we, um, we asked the community, my organization, uh, what would Dallas look like without racism? And so many people answered that they didn't even know what that looked like because it's never happened before. And so I think the, the artist and the creativity and being able to sort of imagine a better world is, is so important to, to lead us and to inspire us all to think differently. Um, I think we're running close to the half hour, but um, for people that have seen your work at the DMA and want to follow along and want to learn more about your work and, and support in the future, how can people find you? You mentioned Instagram. Um, what's yeah. the best way to follow follow along with your work? Well, you know, I, I do have a. You're, I'm glad you remind me. I got to update my website. It's just it's just melchen.org. You know, I'm a I'm not a com uh, uh, or a communist really, though I may left lean. Uh, I'm I'm just an organism, okay, and uh, that's one way. But there's probably if you just Google me, I, I'm sure there's propaganda out there. But now that we've talked to each other. Uh, they know where to find me. We can correct any misconceptions that may be out there, you know. 
and we can do that. But if you look at the, the body of work, you, you'll find that, that I, I do all these different things and some more successfully than others. And, and I, I think what I'm saying is that it's not just one thing. It's, it's, a, it's a life, you know, and it's a life that, uh, you know, when, when the, the Greek saying the unexamined life is not worth living, I think Nishi picked up on that. Then, then I, it was interesting when I heard someone mention that. I don't know if it was Cornell West or someone who mentioned if you're a black American, if you examine your life, you'll find pain. I think that's profound to hear that, to, to think about that, to think of other people, what they go through. A way of empathizing is your step to getting a, a, a legitimate foothold in what it takes to be a human being. And, uh, and you know, I think that is, that's worth living. To, to have the have the grounds to examine your life. And then you don't have to beat yourself up about it. You just got to look at yourself a little bit, you know, because the world is full of these delusions that you buy in, that I buy into myself. I, I shouldn't say you because I don't know you that well. But that would be yeah, accusatory. Yeah. But you know what I'm saying. It's like, that's what it is. So you look more and I'm, I'm you know, I'm somewhat approachable when I'm not hiding out in my witness protection program. My wannabe witness protection program. <laughs> Thank you so much.